Education prepares you for your future place in the family, society, and workplace. At USLS, we prepare you to be career ready for the 21st century global workplace. Our expected Lasallian graduate attributes empowers you to be socially responsible Christian. Think beyond your self-interest. Become more aware of realities and contribute in your own way to nation building and transformation of society. Take more responsibility for your own needs and your own growth. Experience what it means to be a catalyst for social transformation through your participation in community service. Effective communicator. Improve and gain confidence in using effective oral, written, and multimedia communications so you can express your thoughts and ideas. Use digital technology and communication tools to research, organize, and communicate ideas and information. Work productively or collaborate with others in teamwork and be more flexible in adapting to changing situations. Critical thinker. Become more open to innovative and creative ideas and ways of thinking. Sharpen your critical thinking by analyzing issues before forming your own opinion. Be more solution-oriented when challenged by problems and translate or apply theories learned to practical situations and applications. Welcome to the University of St. LaSalle, where better futures are created now. After 66 years of presence in Negros and in the city of Bacolod, we continue to make a commitment towards the human and Christian education of many young people and adults who seek learning. Italians know how to balance the mind and the heart. We know when to be objective, we know when to be critical, and more importantly, we know how to be compassionate. And this is really important if we are to be socially responsible Christians. And that the ratings are going now with our country and around the world, um, I believe that this makes us an asset to society. Furthermore, Alasalian is taught how to become an effective leader. A leader who has a clear vision in mind and a leader who has a passion to serve. And you put all these together, and this is why I believe Alasalian is so special. I, I, I love being in LaSalle because it, it helps me live out my faith. Uh, I am fortunate enough to uh, have been part of a network or a system of Lasallian schools and communities uh, all over the world. Personally, I am one of the many Lasallian educators who is given that responsibility to make a difference or to leave a mark, uh, a good lasting impression upon uh, my students. Lasalle is not just a school, it is a home. A home of students who are nurtured with the teachings of St. John Baptist de Lasalle that creates a big impact in the life of many. My experience here in Lasalle is where you learn things even to stuff that doesn't really matter to most, but it would for you. Our successes can be traced to the distinct Lasallian education that is received in the classroom, outside of the classroom, and in many places where learning is made available in this universe.
The Bachelor of Science in Nursing is a four-year degree program designed to develop the competencies required of a beginning nurse practitioner. It will equip students with the knowledge, attitude, and skills needed to help individuals, families, groups, and communities cope with current and potential threats to health. Pushing the limits of one's capacity. Touching lives with consistency, care, and compassion. Living up to the standards of what it takes to be a true Lasallian nurse. Welcome everyone to the University of St. LaSalle College of Nursing and Center for Research and Engagement Webinar 2021, entitled The Next Normal, New Directions, Opportunities, and Challenges. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items for the smooth flow in today's event. This webinar is being recorded and we are live on Facebook. You will have the opportunity to ask questions to our speaker by typing your questions in the Q&A box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect this and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You will also receive a certificate for attending this webinar after you accomplish the evaluation uh, form. Evaluation link will be posted after the presentation. Thank you. And now to formally start our webinar, may I invite everyone to invoke the Almighty as we begin with a prayer to be followed by the National Anthem.
Wat alleen nog gedaan moet worden, is om iedereen de kracht te geven om te worden wat hij wil. Nee, nu kan het niet kado. Kan niet, nee, nu koor kunnen maar pukken als een mirage praat niet staan. Ik hoop dat je een beetje kan zeggen. Kalem iman, layanan, maar ook een communie. Simulan natin en mga pagbabago na gusto natin makita. Mga pagbabago na nagsisimula sa atin. in this virtual conference room, I recognize some familiar names of participants coming from different government and private institutions. Welcome, everyone. At this juncture, may I invite the Dean of the University of St. LaSalle College of Nursing, Dean Ivy Edemni, to give us her welcome remarks. Thank you, Ms. Christine. The new normal has taken its toll on the country's educational system including our physical, mental, and financial wellness, but it has definitely opened new opportunities for faculty researchers to pioneer new approaches to research with flexibility and accessibility, and also for the administration to develop new directions that would redefine research in the new normal. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to my fellow Lasallian educators and researchers. I welcome you all to this webinar. Today, we are honored and blessed to have with us a renowned resource speaker who is a Lasallian with a very vast international experience in research engagements and publications. Thank you, Dr. Ia, for saying yes to our invitation. You are indeed a leader in this field. So I am fully confident that your knowledge, experience, and expertise will provide important insights on strengthening and promoting our research capabilities in this new normal. As research evolves, this already becomes an international endeavor. To all the participants, it is my hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity to have uh, exchange of ideas or views and share your experiences. So again, welcome and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Dean Ivy Edemni. And now to give us the objectives of this webinar, may I call on Mr. Vincent Sulidu. Thank you, Ma'am Christine. Okay. At the end of the presentation, the learner is expected to describe how the pandemic has disrupted nursing research, practice, and education. Second, discuss how these disruptions create opportunities to redefine nursing research, 
practice, and education. And lastly, discuss the implications of the next normal in research in advancing health and health equity among Filipino immigrants in the U.S. and globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Vincent. I know everyone is now very eager to listen to our resource speaker. Moving right along, may I call on Dr. Shaila M. Trajera to introduce to us our guest speaker. Thank you, Ms. Christine. Our webinar speaker this morning is a true-blooded Lasallian nurse educator. His newer scholarly researches are beyond counting with publication and advocacies on Filipinos in the U.S. on non-communicable diseases. He is currently as well the, the VP for the PNA education, uh, leading the nurses as to how they can take care of the needs of the community through nursing care. His books include innovative strategies in teaching nursing exemplars of optimal learning outcomes in 2020 which we hope to have in our health education classes, hopefully next year. Also, another publication is the 301 Careers in Nursing, which he co-authored with Dr. Fitzpatrick. At present, he is an assistant dean, clinical adjunct, faculty affairs, and clinical associate professor of the New York University, Rory Mayer's College of Nursing. Without further ado, I would like to present to you my batchmate with whom we are actually so proud. In fact, a batchmate last night said, I will be there because I am a fan of my batchmate. So without further ado, let us all welcome our renowned Lasallian nurse educator, Dr. Emerson Ian. Let us give him a warm round of applause. Okay, so thank you so much, Batchmate. And thank you so much, Dean Edemning, for this opportunity uh, to really go back home virtually. Oh, you don't know how much I really wanted to go back and uh, do this in person. And even to just spend a you know, few days or maybe a week uh, back in Bacolod, but because of some travel restrictions, I possibly could not. So actually my mom was calling me on Facebook just now. I just have to like discontinue her because I don't think she knew that I was gonna speak uh, in this webinar today. Anyway, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a couple of slides that I'd like to share with you because really the purpose of this presentation is to engage you all. Um, this is a very uh, uh, times, very challenging times and we all could relate to what's happening to every one of us and how this pandemic has affected nursing research, nursing education and nursing practice. So wherever we are in the world, we share the same common experience in my opinion that we are really threading the new normal. So give me a few seconds. I'm gonna share my screen briefly. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. Wonderful. All right. So my the title of my um, presentation today is the next normal, the new directions, challenges, and opportunities. It's so broad, but I really want to focus on three areas uh, that are near and dear to nurses. Um, nursing research, obviously, nursing education, and nursing practice. You really cannot separate uh, each of these components because they all loop together. You know, one affects the other. That's why in our nursing profession, one leads to another, one affects the other. So you really cannot separate nursing education practice and um, uh, research because they all really are interrelated. And before I start, uh, really a shout out to everyone. It's still happy nurse, International Nurses Day here in, in the US. It's still May 6th. That's the International Day of Nurses. We are celebrating Nurses Month here in the US. 
I know it's October in the Philippines, right? And we are also celebrating the extended year of the nurse and the midwife, as well as the international year of health and care worker. So nurses in particular, um, you know, um, distinctly from other uh, healthcare uh, professionals have really been put on the spotlight. And this is really our time to showcase what we do. You would be very surprised that not a lot of people know what nurses do. And it's only now during this pandemic here that people start asking questions, what do nurses do? And the reality is really very humbling to them to know that we work very hard at the front line, that we just are not caregivers, but we are also researchers and that we are also practitioners and also nurse educators. So there is a, um, a renewed uh, appreciation of the role that nurses play in healthcare and practice um, and uh, global health. So these are my objectives. I'm not going to go over them because they have been described earlier. Uh, I will share my experiences of how this pandemic really has impacted um, in everything that I do as a professional in my research, in my education role, in my educator's role, as well as in my practice. And I define practice very broadly and I'll define it as uh, community practice. So I will share all of those experiences with you later on. But I wanna make it real by giving you an exemplar specifically in the area of research uh, how this pandemic has really made me revisit and um, redesigned the, uh, the, the, the methods of my research because I obviously could not do face-to-face -face, uh, data collection during the time of pandemic. So I will share with you, it's still a work in progress, but uh, I would like to share with you some of the insights I've learned while I have pivoted to a virtual way of doing research. Okay, so let's create some context here uh, before I uh, go over some of the um, examples and discussion for each of these topics. So can you remember what occupied you before March, 2020? Um, I post that question because I'm gonna share with you my experiences as well. But before I started, we would like to know from your end, what was it like before March 2020 when the pandemic started in the area of nursing education, in the area of nursing research, or in the area of nursing practice? So you may pick one or two or all of them. If you can share a word or two or a sentence or even a short phrase as to what you can remember prior to the start of the pandemic in March, 2020. So I'm gonna give you a few seconds to jot some ideas because I really wanna uh, hear from you. What was it like before we went into lockdown or we went into this pandemic state? And there is no right or wrong answer, obviously. You can just uh, indicate what do you remember most before the lockdown started in the area of nursing education research or practice. All right, I am not seeing any responses at all in the chat. Okay, I see face-to-face, -face, classroom interaction, hospital duty. All right. And I recognize that name. It's Miss Chua, right? One of our favorite teachers. Meeting up with my professor in class in master nursing. Research was actively carried out in all areas. Okay, so thank you for, for sharing those thoughts. And that was the norm prior to the pandemic. So obviously it has changed. So let me share with you 
to provide you uh, with some context here, what, what happened prior to March, 2020. So I'll start with nursing education for me. So yes, I was teaching face-to-face. Uh, -face. We have large classes at, at New York University where I teach. Uh, in one classroom, we have about 160 students uh, in one big classroom and there is no social distancing, uh, obviously. And actually, uh, I taught an elective course in Florence, Italy, uh, later in the later part of January uh, for two weeks prior to the lockdown. So when I was in Italy, uh, we, we did a tour of uh, the different healthcare facilities in Florence and the neighboring states or cities around Florence, we went to the nursing home, we went to the hospitals, we get a chance to interact with the nurses, with other healthcare givers. And we kind of like got an understanding that the Italian, health, Italian healthcare system is very focused on the family. And it's an older, uh, the population in Italy is much older. Um, and I remembered uh, we were staying in, um, the Domo, um, we were very lucky because our place is right across the Domo, you know, the big, the big cathedral in Florence that you see in the pictures, you know, when you Google Florence, Italy. Um, there was a, a, a museum right across the street where we were staying and we visited that uh, museum. And it's a museum about the Black Plague that happened in, I think, 14th, 15th century. As we know, Florence is the center of the Renaissance, right? That's where all the Michelangelo's, the Da Vinci's and all of that started. Um, but they also were plagued. Uh, there were plagues, the Black Plague, that really decimated a large part of, of the population. When we were going around the museum, we were looking at pictures and paintings of deaths, of destruction, of illness, and we actually saw how they took care of patients who have been afflicted by, by the plague. And I was with another colleague, you know, we're going around and looking at the picture and he said, oh, what, what is it like during that time when people are dying on the streets, when they don't know what's causing this pandemic? And it was just a lot of deaths around them. So unbeknownst to us, the COVID-19 virus has already been spreading around the world. And I had a sense or without my sense actually, but it was actually in Europe, in Italy during that time. Um, when the pandemic uh, struck the United States, we thought that that virus came from China, but for some reason when they analyzed the variant of, of the virus that afflicted New York at the early phase, it actually came from Europe. So it went to Europe and from Europe went to New York, uh, one of the early places, one of the uh, places that got um, uh, afflicted by the pandemic. And guess where in Europe did that virus put more than likely uh, was coming from, from Italy. So we were there um, when actually the virus was spreading. I felt a little uneasy when I came back from Europe um, but I don't know if that was just flu because flu was very rampant or it was some sort of a, you know, you know, travel sickness of some sort. I would never know, uh, but uh, unbeknownst really to us that this pandemic has been brewing. With regard to uh, nursing practice, um, prior to the pandemic, actually, uh, when I got back from, from Europe uh, after teaching there for two weeks, we went back to the community because I'm a chair of a Kalusugan coalition here uh, in, in New York. It's a nonprofit organization devoted to promoting health among Filipino immigrants or Filipino Americans. And our focus is, to, uh, is on cardiovascular health. So we do a lot of health teaching. We do a lot of, of health screening, blood pressure check, health education, so on and so forth in the community. So a few weeks after I, I left Europe, we had a health forum when we invited a community, we invited officials from the city and some of our stakeholders to attend a face-to-face -face gathering to discuss uh, the problems that afflict the Filipino population. So it's, um, it's a very interesting time because looking back or, you know, or, or on hindsight, um, 
we were just living our normal, not knowing that in a couple of weeks, we all will shut down. Nursing research wise, I was waiting for a proposal that I submitted uh, for a grant. And the, of course, the grant was a face-to-face -face type of research. It's a mixed method study. You do a quantitative study and then simultaneously a qualitative piece of that. So the proposal was, of course, face-to-face -face and a face-to-face -face, uh, data collection process. Now, what happened after that? Um, so this is when uh, we switch to uh, the new normal or the pandemic um, reality uh, in nursing education, nursing research, and nursing practice. So I'll first cover nursing education. So we pivoted to virtual learning. I saw some of the responses in the chat earlier, what you were doing prior to. It was face-to-face, -face, obviously, but it was not possible uh, when we locked down. In mid-March of 2020, uh, we were told by our administrators, by the university officials that uh, pack your bags because we will be uh, uh, locking the building um, for an extended period of time. So whatever you could carry with you, please carry them because we don't know when we're gonna come back. So that was mid-March of 2020. And I have never been back in person to my office since then. So that was more than a year already. I am not sure what happened to my plants. I'm quite sure they're dead by now. I don't know how much, what's the layer of dust <laughs> on my desk. I don't know, but I heard that our housekeeping uh, are able to, housekeeping staff are able to keep up with cleaning and it's, it's spanking clean actually right now they said, but we switched to virtual overnight. So. Once we decided to, to go virtual, we had to learn Zoom um, almost instantaneously by switching to virtual learning. What you'll notice about Zoom at the very beginning, that it is a very exciting technology, right? To be able to see everyone in Zoom, to be able to do a lecture in Zoom, to be able to do uh, a meeting on Zoom. And it's a very novel way of engaging folks. So we're very, worried obviously because it's a lockdown but we quickly learned how to do it and there was a lot of adrenaline that kept us going and getting engaged with zoom it was a novelty but we know that after a while that novelty will wear off so for the remainder of the spring semester mid-semester we went virtual during the summer we continued to be virtual so there were still some adrenaline that keeps on pushing us to do the Zoom, but towards the end of the summer semester, everybody started complaining about Zoom fatigue. So Zoom fatigue is very real when we all know that it is very real by now. So the pivot now is to really help faculty to some sort of disconnect from Zoom when they're not using it. And at the same time, how to really disconnect from work when they're quote unquote home at the same time. How do you really dis disconnect from work when your office is right there in your bedroom? So actually right now I'm talking to you, behind me you see a, a screen, a virtual screen, but that's actually my bed right there. And my office desk is right here at the corner of my bedroom facing uh, a window. So it's very hard still to separate work from life and the Zoom fatigue, the, um, you know, the, 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 just the anxiety and, the, and, and, the, and just everything that's coming together, uh, it's been really very difficult for everyone to adjust. With regard to uh, nursing education, uh, our clinical also were suspended when we switched to, to virtual. We switched to virtual clinical, uh, we thankfully we were able to recreate a semblance of a face-to-face -face clinical when we went into the fall semester. So students were able to go back to the hospital for their clinical. We had to follow health guidelines as dictated by the city and the state, and of course, by the federal, as well as the uh, guidelines from hospitals. So we were very successful in 
uh, putting our, 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 our students back to clinical during the fall. But our simulation though uh, was also very successful because we were able to also let students uh, come in to simulation on a very modified schedule. It was really like um, an orchestra playing to making sure that everybody comes in, they have their ID, uh, they swipe in the, the you know, the, um, the turnstile outside of the building will not open unless they're clear, they're COVID negative and they're cleared by the university. And then when they're up in the simulation rooms, the seats are uh, placed far apart so that they really are adhering to the six feet uh, distance and social distancing. So I am very proud that our simulation really became some sort of a model of nursing education everywhere uh, because we were just very proactive and uh, we were very adamant that we would really wanna provide some sort of a semblance to our students, although it's a very short simulation. We used to have short simulation of about four or five hours uh, prior to the pandemic, but during the pandemic, we modified it to uh, one and a half hours. Students would go in very, very specific what uh, they have things that they're gonna have to accomplish there's a lot of pre-work as well as there's a lot of follow-up work that's all done virtually, but they were there in person for that short period of time to really connect with everyone and to really uh, get that observation and that uh, interaction from, from faculty and from their classmates. With regard to uh, nursing practice, one thing we learned about the pandemic uh, not just here in the US, but I think this is global as well, that we really lacked um, planning and that we really did not put a lot of emphasis on public health. And it was very, very inadequate. And the many years of not prioritizing health prevention and health promotion have really resulted in, in dismal outcomes um, in our response to the pandemic. Um, Everywhere we're not prepared, but it would have been maybe a better experience if we put a lot of resources and effort on health promotion and health, um, you know, on prevention of diseases. I could give, I could give an example in the US here, um, only a 3% of healthcare expenditures are devoted to public health, as opposed to 32% of national healthcare expenditures devoted to hospital care. So there is that discrepancy already. And it tells you what is the priority of the society, acute versus prevention. So we've learned our lessons. And this is one of the things I think that's gonna change moving forward. And we're looking into this in our curriculum and even our clinical practice in our research to really focus on public health, um, on, on disease prevention uh, and health promotion. And we also, had to deal with um, um, politics here in, in our, um, in, in the US. Uh, I'm quite sure you heard a lot of the things that have been said in the news about wearing a mask here in the US has become so political. Um, and they say this, uh, I'm not saying this, but uh, you can actually tell as per some of these news items, um, your political leaning if you are wearing or not wearing a mask. So it really became a political statement. Um, and that for some reason, and, I, and we believe this, has really has contributed to why uh, we had a spike that we had at the very beginning and why we had really difficulty curtailing the pandemic um, you know, when, when it first started. Telehealth, uh, telehealth was implemented and uh, people gravitated towards that because there was no choice. Um, we suspended elective surgeries and elective surgeries here in, in the US, those where a lot of revenues from hospitals come from. So when you suspend elective surgeries or elective operations, a lot of resources are lost. Uh, that's why a lot of our healthcare facilities still are, um, are, are still in dire straits financially, economically, because of the loss of income uh, during the pandemic. Um, also, 
uh, the role of the uh, frontliners. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that with a focus on, on Filipino nurses and healthcare workers because we really um, were the focus of the spotlight because of a grim statistic that really is very shocking. And, and just to think of this, and I'll share this with you as well later on, that 31% or almost a third of all nurse deaths here in the United States are Filipinos. And think about that, a third of all nurse deaths here in the US are Filipinos, despite only being 4.5% of the total nursing workforce here in the US. So we grabbed the spotlight for a very wrong reason, uh, but it also made us more visible and it made a lot of other things visible that have been hidden for many, many years. And I'll talk about the, the model minority and the health inequity that really became very apparent uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we also uh, now realize that we need to abide by public health guidance and they need to be uh, consistent. They need to be clear. They need to be scientifically based and they need to be communicated to the masses, to the public. Um, there's a lot of information back and forth uh, at the very beginning and even during uh, you know, the later part of the year as to the guidelines. Are you gonna wear an N95? Or are you gonna wear a surgical mask? Or are you gonna wear just a cloth mask? Which one is which? Um, is it a droplet uh, infection uh, spread by droplet or spread by, by contact? So there's a lot of uncertainty and understandably so at the very beginning, uh, but it really, really created a lot of, um, of miscommunication as well as misinformation, if I may say. Um, and, in, and really affected the, the handling uh, of this pandemic. So moving on to uh, nursing research, uh, the fears of COVID-19 and social distancing uh, have hindered participant recruitment. And I shared about that a little earlier, enrollment of participants as well as involvement in ongoing studies. So I know studies have been uh, suspended, just you can't get into the lab, you can't collect information, so you have to stop. So it was really a conundrum here uh, in, in terms of research because uh, from a, a public, a private university uh, who has a, a large research enterprise, it was really, really uh, problematic to a lot of our research faculty because that's where the scholarship come from. That's where a lot of our revenues come from, from, from this grant fundings and uh, from, from the funds coming from, from this grant application. And also uh, scholarly writing uh, for some reason uh, has been very mixed. Uh, some have become very productive during the pandemic, but some have kind of like um, became very unproductive. And, uh, and understandably so because of the stresses uh, during the pandemic. I posted there uh, the book that uh, Batch, uh, uh, Dr. Hera mentioned, because this book uh, from Springer, The Innovative Strategies in Teaching Nursing, Exemplars of Optimal Learning Outcomes that I co-edited with another colleague, got published in March of last year. So there were already plans on how we're gonna launch this, how we're going to introduce this in person, but all of that just went haywire. We can't do anything. So we just have to suspend everything that we've planned. We actually planned on launching this in the Philippines because some of the authors here in, in the book are, are from, uh, from UP uh, and from uh, University of Santo Tomas. So we had big plans on how maybe we could promote the book uh, in, the, in the Philippines because all the topics and, and the information contained in are very applicable everywhere. Um, um, in the world, uh, most specifically, you know, in, in, in the Philippines. Uh, so that became really an issue. Um, I just want to highlight that because, yes, I was very productive <laughs> before the pandemic and a little bit productive during the pandemic, but it really affected a lot of us uh, with the way how we, uh, uh, we, we, we measure productivity in terms of 
publications and presentations. And presentations have become virtual. Um, and there were some presentations that we were set to, to do in person at that time, but because of the, of the pandemic, obviously all conferences got canceled. Some switched to virtual and it was a very different experience. So a lot of people just got very disappointed that it's going to be virtual at the very beginning. I didn't even bother to submit an abstract. But later on, when it, be, it was becoming more of a norm, then people started submitting their, their abstracts again and have accepted the, the fact that it's just gonna be virtual uh, for now. Um, and I'd like to also uh, point out that morals have been really affected uh, during the pandemic. There is a word I'd like to introduce to you about how many people you know, feel or still feeling during the pandemic. It's called languishing. So, you know, this article from the New York Times really defined languishing as a state wherein you're kind of like suspended, you're not moving forward, you're not be moving backward. It's just like you're just going with the flow. And productivity is obviously impacted, and um, your um, motivation and zeal to, to do your work, to do your scholarship, or to do other personal things are just suspended. So you're, it's like you're in the middle of depression and being apathetic or being, um, yeah, being apathetic. So it's, it's neither, but you're right there uh, in the middle. More recently, I encountered another article in the New York Times which described the exact opposite of languishing, which I think a lot of people are now uh, feeling uh, after seeing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel with vaccinations here in the US getting uh, better with more people accessing the vaccine. As of yesterday, I checked uh, about 35% of US citizens have received uh, full vaccinations and about maybe 50% have received one dose. So it's in a better light. Um, and so the opposite of languishing that I described to you, the word that they use is flourishing. So a lot of people are using that word now that they see the end of this and they see better things to come. So people are describing themselves as in the state of flourishing. So if you have time, just Google it. You'll say languishing versus flourishing and, and, and you'll see that uh, a great description uh, of, of those two terms. So um, focusing on uh, nursing research. So one thing that I'd like to emphasize is that yes, um, research has been suspended, research has been affected, but it actually invigorated a lot of us researchers to focus on something that became very, that became exposed during the pandemic. And I'm talking about here the health inequities. Um, just wanna share with you that we used to talk about health inequities in the Filipino American community, but it's sometimes you know not being heard or sometimes being considered inconsequential because of the number of Filipinos here in America. But the situation changed when you try to unpack why so many Filipino nurses and healthcare workers actually became, uh, became fatality outcomes of COVID-19. And one thing that could potentially have led to that is that many of these Filipinos who have perished as, uh, due to COVID-19 have pre-existing conditions or comorbidities that make them vulnerable to the severity of the symptoms of COVID-19, including deaths. So I'm talking about hypertension, I'm talking about diabetes, I'm talking about cardiovascular diseases um, uh, states, especially among Filipino Americans. So there was a focus on that. And not only that, there was an unpacking as to why folks have these conditions. And we are now looking at these conditions via the lens of social justice, via the lens of how does one's experience as an immigrant after being here in this country, after being subjected to many stresses have contributed to that. Um, the summer last year was very challenging here in the US. 
uh, because of the Black Lives Matter, you I'm quite sure you may have heard the news about the killing of a black man, uh, George Floyd, that really triggered uh, and intensified the call to social justice and um, you know and, and and to address police brutality because it really again exposed that the country, the society needs to correct itself because the system and the structure that it is built on is flawed. And I'm talking about the sins of racism and prejudice that has been threaded through the history of the US. Um, and that has caused not just social anguish and inequality, but also health disparities. So people are looking at health disparities now in minority populations, including Filipino Americans, uh, under that lens, that it is really through that lens that things are being viewed now, the disparities in health and equity. Now, there's also a question about the impact to healthcare workforce. So just think about this. Uh, the International Council of Nurses, uh, prior to the pandemic, has projected that about maybe 10 million nurses will be needed worldwide by year, I think by year 2050. Uh, and with the effect of the pandemic, they actually increased that projection to now 14 million nurses needed globally. And why is that so? Because they call it the COVID-19 effect. They are anticipating a lot of nurses would retire prematurely. A lot of nurses would leave their jobs. A lot of nurses will just call it quits. And we've seen some of those already in healthcare. And my question about, you know, uh, as it relates to Filipino um, nurses is that how this is going to impact, if any, on the view of the role of nursing and um, the, the thought of you're gonna be a frontliner, you're gonna be in front of, you know, of diseases and you're gonna be subjected to all of these stresses. How would that impact nursing as a career choice uh, among young folks or among young, um, young, young, um, young adults um, to get into the healthcare professional um, courses uh, program. Um, my question is also about the uh, children of uh, immigrant nurses here or immigrant healthcare workers here in the US. A lot of their children go into nursing because of the role modeling that they see and their parents, their titas, you know, their their kuya, their neighbor, their family friends uh, who are nurses. Now that this has occurred, would there be an impact to nursing as a career choice among the younger uh, population, especially among Filipino Americans? So those are some of the questions that have yet to be answered. Um, and we are wondering, but definitely um, it's gonna be a reckoning uh, in a lot of ways for healthcare workers here, not just in the US, but also around the globe. So I alluded to this data earlier, but sometimes it's, um, it's just important to emphasize the point that um, Filipino RNs have been disproportionately impacted by this COVID-19. And there's a lot of reasons that this why this might be, uh, why this came about. And I shared some of them with you. One of them is the, maybe potentially the presence of comorbidities in this population. And I'm gonna share a, um, a slide on that to, to, to back that up, that there's really a health disparity among Filipino Americans, but also a significant number of Filipino nurses work the front lines. Um, they are the direct caregivers. They are the direct frontline workers. So if you compare the statistics between, for example, white nurses and Filipino American nurses, overwhelmingly Filipino nurses work the frontline. So potentially, uh, uh, this puts them at a disadvantage because they are more exposed and are vulnerable to the effects of the COVID-19 virus when you work, especially during the early times when we don't know what's causing this infection. So they were there based on the fact that that's their primary role. Um, and there are a lot of other reasons why, and there's a lot of questions actually why, and this is something to share with you. Um, 
you know, we are prepared uh, with a bachelor's degree because that's a, a requirement in the Philippines, right, to practice nursing. So when uh, a Filipino nurse goes to the U.S., um, they're already backward prepared. Um, actually, if you look at the statistics, more Filipino nurses are prepared at the backward level than other uh, groups of uh, of nurses, white, blacks, Hispanic, all that are group. Understandably so, as I said, because uh, that's their initial preparation. That That's like before they even leave the Philippines, that's the requirement. But it's also very interesting to know and, and note this, that only 8% of Filipino nurses continue on to obtain a master's degree or higher compared to about 20% of white nurses and about 15% of black nurses. So for some reason, we all come to the US very highly qualified with our education, but something happened, we just stopped. So there, that needs to be, to be looked at because we all know that when you have a, a higher education that you, um, that you could qualify, for example, for a leadership position that opens up leadership opportunities for you. And we all know what that means. That means representation. So representation is key here because someone will be advocating for you. Um, I, and so I'm opening up these questions because we don't know the answers. It's really more questions now than answers, but it really makes things uh, very obvious now that we need to look at this at, at, at the different scale. And one thing to emphasize about the model minority myth that I mentioned earlier, you know, Asian Americans as a group are looked at as uh, a model minority because if you look at the surface, that group has, uh, has achieved um, the status here in the US. They have more education, they are um, socioeconomically advantaged compared to other group. It appears like they're healthier than other groups. And it also though, um, disadvantage um, Asian Americans because when we have issues, they'll say, what right do you have to complain? You already are in this state, but Asian Americans are very diverse. It's not just a monolithic group. We are composed of many different groups. So Asian Americans here, of course, are Chinese, Korean, Lao, Indian, Filipinos. And when you break them up, when you tease them up into separate groups, that's when you see the differences. So the model minority myth is really a myth because on the surface, it looks okay. But if you dig deeper, if you separate all these groups, the disparities become very, very apparent. And I'll give an example very quickly on the next slide here. This is a result of a study uh, that was done by a colleague, uh, Dia in uh, Jen Nazareno from Brown University they look at um, health disparities and comparing five health conditions, obese, overweight, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, among three groups. So the black bar you see represent the percentage of whites for this study. That's 57.7%, right, ha are overweight or, or, or overweight in the California Health Interview Survey. Asian Americans, if you look at as a group right there, 61.2, um, there's a little bit difference, but not a lot of difference. But if you tease out Filipino Americans on that yellow bar, because that's, that yellow bar is specific to Filipino Americans, you see the disparity there. So they're a lot higher compared to whites and to the Asian American aggregate. aggregate. Hypertension, look at hypertension, the second data, health indicator there. 31% of whites for this survey have hypertension. When you look at Asian Americans as an aggregate, only 22.9%, 22, right? It's not a lot. It's actually less than the whites. But if you tease out the Filipino data from that Asian aggregate group, you see the disparity. So that's our point. We need to disaggregate the data because you can see the true data when you tease them apart. Uh, and, and, and that goes to show here in other health indicators as well. So with a few minutes that I have left because I was given you know, to, to be done before an hour or about 45, 50 minutes, 
I'll give you an example on how I pivoted uh, my research um, during this time of the pandemic. So as what I shared earlier with you, I was waiting for actually for two proposals that I submitted uh, for funding. Uh, one is an NIH from an NIH uh, National Institute of Health Center uh, at, at Rutgers University uh, on a center for uh, older adult uh, Asian Americans, that, that's their center. So I submitted this um, prior to the pandemic. So I, I, I said that I'm gonna look at acculturation oral health and dental care service use among Filipino older adult immigrants in the US. So they made me aware that my proposal got accepted during the time of the pandemic. And my proposal was based on these, um, this premise and this, uh, and this information that really there is no study, uh, very little study that look at oral health and dental care service use among Filipino older adults, which is really, a, which makes up a significant number of uh, Filipinos here in the US. So that was the, the premise of the study. So I'll go over quickly the, the specific aims because there's about four aims um, and, and they're not that relevant, but I'm just showing that it was very comprehensive because that was based on the face-to-face -face, uh, component. So as I said, I was gonna do a mixed methods approach. So I have four aims for this study and they looked very good on paper because I was gonna do them in person I was gonna interview people in Queens and other parts of New York and even New Jersey to get my data uh, to be able to, to meet the specific aims. And this is some of the description of the design of that study. So it's a, a parallel mixed methods approach. So I'm doing a quant and, quant and qual simultaneously. And I was gonna conduct it in New York, as I said, uh, I have inclusion criteria, 60, 65 years and older, actually the initial criteria. And I propose to recruit hundred participants to complete the survey. And those who have completed the survey will be invited to participate in a focus group, about 30 of them to dig deeper and to learn more about oral health and dental care service use uh, for this population. And this was what I said I was gonna do for the quantitative part. I'm gonna use all these instruments. I'm gonna have a social demographic questionnaire. I'm gonna have uh, scales that have been reliable and validated uh, from research. And for the qualitative piece, this is what I'm gonna ask them uh, to get some, uh, some perceptions and views of how to take care of their mouth and teeth uh, and, the, and their dental care practices. And I also was very interested in knowing and learning uh, and finding out about their oral health status prior to immigrating to the US. Well, this is a, a very busy slide, but I would just like to show that I had to pivot. Um, I could wait it out, but I do wanna wait the whole year, hoping that I could do a face-to-face -face research. So i made a decision along with my team and my mentors to go ahead with the research but this time to do a virtual component. So instead of doing a face-to-face -face recruitment and data collection you know, in person, we would be doing it via the phone or electronically. So we would give the participant an option uh, based on uh, their choice, obviously, if they qualify for the study, how to do the survey. If they chose to do the survey via uh, electronic and we'll send them the link and they could complete it on their own. But if they wanna do it over the phone, we also have people who will help them complete the survey. And the initial uh, uh, proposal was to do it in New York face-to-face. -face. Since we're doing this virtually, this actually opened up a whole new opportunity for me to do a nationwide study. So instead of doing it in New York now, I will be doing it in Texas as well, and also um, another arm in California. So instead of a total of 100 participants that I planned on recruiting uh, in the New York area, I said, okay, let me do 50 in New York, 50 in California, and 50 in Texas. And you might ask, why did you choose Texas and California? 
uh, well, the East Coast, of course, that's New York. West Coast, the, the largest population of Filipinos live in California. I would like to find out how different they are, or maybe they're not, with the population in New York. And also in Texas, that's up and coming uh, hub of, of Filipinos here in, in the US. So I really want to see if there are any differences or what are the similarities among these three sites. Um, and then I decrease the age inclusion instead of it as 65, I went down to 60, so that could capture a lot. And the reason why I want to do a telephonic survey because I am I'm, I'm aware that many of the participants might not be comfortable with the internet use or electronic survey or a computer use. So giving them an option would be an appropriate approach, uh, in my opinion, uh, as well as also giving them an option to either use an English uh, survey uh, in English language or uh, a Tagalog uh, version of, of the survey. So we're giving that option to them. So this is the uh, timeline that I revised. Uh, I'm a, a year um, late, but everyone is a year late anyway. Uh, so this is a way for me to put everything into perspective that I need to move forward. So right now I'm in the process of piloting the questionnaires. I have engaged participants, volunteers in New York, in Texas and in California to pilot the questions that I'm gonna be using. And I've done it either via the phone for those who chose to, uh, for me to administer it. And I asked them feedback, whether they think about the questions, the length of the questions, the quality of the questions, are they clear? And I've also a group of participants, volunteers, to do it via electronically. So I'm gathering feedback before I finalize the questionnaire and then submit for an IRB and hopefully get um, approval so I could uh, administer my, 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 my uh, research towards the end of the summer or in the middle of the summer towards the fall. Um, I'm also in the process of hiring another research assistant. I have a research assistant who's working with me right now, and she's the one taking care of the, the database, the electronic database uh, for the survey. But I need someone who speaks the language, you know, the uh, Tagalog, uh, because I know that people will be more comfortable uh, during recruitment and during screening if uh, they are able to speak and be comfortable with the person who is obtaining the information. So that I'm sharing with you a little bit of a, a timeline here of what happened. If you see the grant was awarded in August, 2020, and I was paralyzed, I couldn't even do anything in the fall because I was waiting for things to change, but obviously did not. But I said, I need to do something. That's why I really started moving towards the later part of the fall and in the early part of the spring until now. So I'm continuing on, but I started in late fall and in early spring. So what are the challenges and opportunities in the next steps uh, for this research? So I'm creating a multi-state network or team. So, you know, I shared earlier uh, uh, that I am also very active in the community and I'm also part of as what my batchmate introduced me as a, the national chair of the education committee. So this really opened up a lot of networks for me to uh, create um, teams and they're very happy and very willing to help me. Um, uh, move forward this research. They would also help me with recruitment, data collection as well. And um, I also have revised my questionnaire to include questions that relate to how is the COVID-19 impacting their ability, uh, the, 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 the study participants' ability to, uh, to, uh, to maintain or promote oral health and utilize dental care services. And of course, I really want to dig into uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, experiences of, of uh, prejudice among this group, if there is any, or how does it affect their perception of oral health and their experience of oral health. So I've included a questionnaire about everyday discrimination uh, as part of the, my research, and I, I alluded to you that I'm piloting the data um, um, now, and then when I have the data for this study, hopefully that's going to inform a larger study that would be interventional in nature uh, uh, to really uh, do something about the, the case of oral health. 
status among Filipino Americans. So to end my, um, my presentation, uh, it's, it's been quite a year. Uh, there's a lot of adjustments, a lot of um, really they call about, they call resilience. I think that's the overused word of, of the year <laughs> or of two years. But we learned that resilience is not just an individual responsibility anymore. I mean, how much more can you be resilient? To be very honest, if your community, if your workplace even, if the institution that you were working do not take into account the resilience of individuals, right now they describe it as the breaking point of resilience. So people are more mindful now that when you talk about resilience, you also really need to, to do it on a larger scale not just put the onus and the responsibility uh, on the individual. So um, what's keeping me active right now, um, I find a lot of meaning in working in the community virtually. Um, I am chair of a Kalusugan coalition who really has been, in my opinion, been educating the Filipino American community about COVID-19 and others. So we've, we've collaborated with many organizations, with several organizations here in, in the US and we've offered webinars um, and we've partnered with a Philippine Consulate General and they have streamed live this, this, uh, this uh, webinar um, across the globe. So it it's really has a global reach. And if there is one thing I'd like to uh, leave um, and describe how it's been thus far for me, um, moving forward, I describe my experience as I'm really hopeful of things to come. And I'm defining hopeful very different. And I've learned this from someone, I did not invent this. I define hopeful as optimism with a plan. So when I hear the word hopeful now, I always think about, yes, I'm optimistic, but it doesn't stop there. I need to have a plan how to get there. So. I hope you glean some information or some insight on my experiences and the experience of us here, uh, how we are dealing with the pandemic, how it has affected my research in particular, my, uh, my role as an educator, my, real, my, my role as a community advocate and a leader here, um, and uh, that it provided you as well as a deeper realization and as, uh, as a deeper understanding of why we are in a situation right now here among Filipino healthcare workers and Filipino RNs um, um, and, and what are the factors that have contributed to that. All right, I think I'm, I've overstayed my welcome, <laughs> everyone. So I thank you all for your attention and I'm gonna stop sharing. And I, I have my email there, uh, you know where to find me if you have any questions, if you wanna I'll continue to engage later on. But I really look forward to your questions and your comments because that's that's how I learn and hear from you um, um, about this discussion. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much to our resource speaker, Dr. Emerson Ia, for that amazing presentation. Indeed, you have given us a very uh, valuable, informative uh, uh, topic and information. And thank you also for sharing your experiences with us. And now, um, may we remind all our participants that if you have any questions, please input it in our Q&A box. And at this time, may we hear some response from our participants, starting from our internal reactor, our very own clinical instructor here at the University of St. LaSalle College of Nursing, Mr. O.J. Jimenez. Thank you, Mantin, and thank you, Dr. Ria. It's been quite a year indeed. Nursing shortage, concerns in nursing education and practice issues. These are 21st century issues trying to be solved by 20th century answers. We must admit that primitive answers will not work now. Thank you, Dr. Emerson, for sharing the status of healthcare in a global perspective and emphasizing the importance of research amidst this pandemic. A very timely topic currently being discussed, actually in our class with uh, Dr. Anchua in Worldviews, Truly, the nursing profession needs to pursue answers that are new and innovative. Before the pandemic, we already have concerns haunting the nursing profession, highlighted by the current pandemic that has indeed disrupted nursing research, practice, and education. 
quoting Phyllis Cooper, she said that nursing shortage today and near future calls for leadership that will new, I mean, find new innovative ways to meet nursing practice without sacrificing quality and safety. Dr. Yi has affirmed the presence of disruption in the ways of working in the profession, not only here in the Philippines, but in a global scale. To quote him, he said, we're sharing the same experience. And definitely, I agree. Dr. Ye mentioned about the utilization of Zoom technology in nursing education. And definitely, all of us here in this Zoom meeting could agree that Zoom fatigue or fatigue is real. Sometimes, one would be tempted to think that since this concern is affecting nurses worldwide, it's just okay. It's a normal occurrence we will adopt. But is it truly okay to be passive rather than be proactive in this pandemic? As discussed earlier, U.S., a first world country being unprepared and lack planning, especially in public health, especially is quite surprising, especially for us in the nursing practice or service sector, who look up to our U.S. counterparts in terms of technology utilization in provision of care. How much more in the Philippines, wherein we have insufficient supplies or resources, I can truly relate to the fact that due to the limitation in accommodating elective cases, hospitals are suffering financially. I also agree with discussion about being proactive in seeking opportunities to redefine nursing research practice and education because in a SWOT analysis, Organizations at times need to make vital decisions, either to focus resources to address weakness and develop strengths or turn weakness into opportunities. But in our case, we need something more than that. Opportunities need to be pursued innovatively. We need to embrace a paradigm shift, not only at the grassroots level, but a paradigm shift is more vital to transpire among leaders. A change of mindset. Dr. Yes' presentation asserted that indeed, we students as newbies in the field of research have to be innovative and have to find ways or topics to be researched that are relevant in our current situation. And one way to help us to be more confident in our practice is by having researches that will actually support our claims and theories about the new ways of working. Research has now become more relevant than ever. Undeniably, the trend in research in the next normal will provide direction to this profession. It is with the hope that the research will eventually advance health and health equity, not only to the Philippine immigrants in the U.S., but also to the heroes of our homeland as well. So to my fellow nurses, let me quote Dr. Yia. Let's all be hopeful. Be optimistic with a plan. Let me end my reaction by saying, a professional is tested not by our capacity to survive, but by having the ability to make true, to make tough decisions in trying times. As the modified plea goes, tough times will make tough nurses. Looking forward to read your book, Innovative Strategies in Teaching Nursing Doctor. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Mr. O.J. Jimenez. And this time, let's hear another response, an inter external reactor, another clinical instructor from West Visaya State University, Mr. Dexter Sindania. Good morning, Dr. Emerson. I am grateful for your insights and discussion. When you presented the events and situation in your setting, which is the U.S., it made me realize that we are not alone and your struggles and concerns are also ours here in the Philippines. It somehow validated my feelings and outlook towards the now and the future. It made me realize further my value as a nurse and it made me in the setting of education or practice. And as a PhD student currently enrolled in uh, my PhD in USLS, uh, it gave me an idea of the possible research topics and it inspired me to further uh, when it comes to doing nursing research. As an educator from WSU College of Nursing, 
I am looking forward to getting a copy of your book on innovative strategies in teaching nursing. I think that will be timely and relevant to our current situation. And we really do need a basis for doing things. And I think that, that would be uh, very much helpful for us right now. Uh, but most of all, your presentation gave us hope with a plan. It's a hope with a plan that you have mentioned earlier that really struck me. Uh, that despite the current situation and challenges, we can still cope and adapt to this next normal, to this new normal, and continue with a, our goal to provide quality nursing care to our clients. So more power to you, Dr. Emerson, and thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you so much, Mr. Dexter Sendanya. And now we will go ahead and take some time to answer some questions. Uh, as now, do we have a question here in our Q&A box? So far, none. Uh, while waiting for your questions, while waiting for you to input your questions, reminding everyone that an evaluation link will be posted later in our chat box. So you need to uh, fill out those evaluation for you to get your certificate. Questions, please? Anyone who would like to ask question? I am sure Dr. Ia, of course, would really love to answer your questions. You may input it in the chat box or in the Q&A box. We'll see. So now, wala. While they're thinking of what to ask me, I just want to respond to the reactors. And I really appreciate of that very quick sharing of insight based on what you heard, because I really struggled initially to say, how should I frame this so that it is not alien to everyone? Because I'm talking from a very different perspective um, from my point of view, so that it's relatable to all. So I guess that's, that's what I like hearing about the responses, because one way or the other, there is some commonality. You identified some, some common themes and some of the reactions, some of the feelings, some of the emotions um, from what I shared with you. But you're right. Um, this is a very universal event that uh, we are still struggling to understand. And it may take many years for us to totally understand what's happening. But in the whole scheme of the history of the world, this is just a blip. Think about it. This will go away. Uh, when we look back to this 20 years ago, we'll say, oh my God, what happened? But we will all remember what we are doing, what we did during this time. That's why it's so clear and so important as well. And this is one thing I always say when I, when I talk to folks, do something that you will remember now that is meaningful to you. And if you could do that to further your education, to further your practice, to be a better community leader and advocate, do that because you'll remember that as your quote unquote contribution during the pandemic. So that's, I'm grateful for the reactions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ia, that's very inspiring. We have one question here, doctor. What is your stand on the use of artificial intelligence for patient care instead of nurses' own judgment, assessment, and critical thinking? Will this be the paradigm shift in healthcare? Let me critique artificial intelligence. Remember artificial intelligence is based on big data, right? But we have to question where did that data come from? There's a lot of things that we need to answer. Could artificial intelligence be a biased data as well? Is it possible that the artificial intelligence data could also be leaning to a system and a structure that created it in the first place? So think about that because the data will only be as good as the, the information, right? That you get from that big data. If the big data is flawed or is biased or is leaning on a structure on a system that is flawed in the first place, then you have a validation of that structure and that big data. So be very careful with big data. Yes, it's got a lot of 
insight. We could learn a lot of insight, um, especially under objective information like diagnoses, you know, um, because they're all a, a conglomeration of all the information put together and then artificial intelligence takes data from that. But in, in data that, that require, for example, subjectivity or data from, um, from responses from folks, um, I would be very, very mindful of where that data come from. Um, but it could potentially uh, think how we do things and, and there's a lot of potential, um, but we need to just understand how the data were gathered. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, doctor. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ia regarding uh, the slow face-to-face, -face, which we are looking forward in our university for the College of Nursing. You mentioned a while ago that uh, you are actually uh, already doing that uh, in New York University. Um, how do you do it? And uh, you said you actually uh, uh, was the one who initiated it first among all other institutions. So we would like to benchmark from you. Okay, sure. Maybe one of the few who have, you know, who have ventured to maintain some semblance of face-to-face. -face. So during the spring, when the pandemic started, that was during March of last year, that is considered a spring semester for us, we switched to virtual. So we canceled our clinical, obviously, you know, because we were on lockdown. The summer semester, the summer semester runs from May up until August. Uh, last year, we continued virtual. We didn't have a choice because we didn't know what we were facing. But during the later part of the summer months, we said that we are ready to bring people back to clinical because if, if you think about it, this will be the nurses who will take care of patients they need to see what's happening now because they are the caregivers, right? As long as we follow guidelines from the state or from the city or from the health department and also follow guidelines of the institution, we are just so lucky because we have access to New York University Langone Medical Center, it's a huge medical center that actually could accommodate all our students. So it's very uniform, consistent, and this is their policy, and we just have to follow that. So for example, the initial policy was people should wear masks. Initially, it was um, a surgical mask, um, and they switched it to N95. So we had to pivot right away, but it was only one change of the policy. Can you just imagine if we're in different hospitals, and different hospitals have different policy? And with regard to the simulation, we plan it out so that when we have, our simulation is inside our building, obviously, you need access to get in. We have turnstiles. You cannot just walk into the door and go up to the room. You actually have to be cleared and your ID and your phone has to uh, be activated and you have to swipe your card and your ID to open the turnstile. So that means you have to have your testing all addressed you have to have every all the parameters all addressed. I'm, I'm just describing it so you can get an idea of what parameters you might want to use to validate that. Um, and then once they have met all the requirements, then the door opens to them. Open door system, and you go up to the room. And when you go in the room, the the, the seats are are uh, positioned so that they're not sitting one on top of the other. They're like six feet apart. And the instructor right there in the front, very systematic this is what we're going to do a b c d when you're done you exit the room there's a hall you go down the stairs another group comes in so it's like really a a production of some sort um and it's a lot of work um but after a while if you've done it once or twice and people know what to do then that becomes a routine so i guess that's the that's the insight that i could share is the beginning part is really very problematic and uh, there's a lot of confusion but once you've established a system and you stick to it it becomes routine thank you very much um another follow-up question regarding research uh, funding uh, more or less uh, on a regular basis how much more or less do you ask for uh 
as a budget for one research project that you are having um, uh, as a proposal? You're talking about the, the funding for for, for your research. research projects because you mentioned a while ago that uh, fundings uh, for your different researches are actually one of the ways wherein you actually try to make uh, your College of Nursing uh, more innovative. Uh, so, which actually led to a lot of your publications as well and books. So, um, more or less, um, uh, can you give us an idea how this actually uh, support your different nursing innovations in your College of Nursing? Yeah, so I'm just going to describe generally of how we generate revenue from research, right? So there is an indirect as well as direct cost of a research. So if it is a federal grant, for example, the amount is set by the government. So it's a competition. So you submit a proposal, you submit a budget that, that would maximize the amount that they uh, have published uh, to, to give you to, uh, to fund your project. And there is an indirect and direct cost to it. So the direct costs are the salaries, you know, the time release, the staff, but there's also an indirect. So that would pay for the light, you know, the, the copy machine and all of that. So those are some of the indirect resources wherein we generate um, uh, revenues because that pays for personnel, obviously, that pays for salary of, of researchers and faculty. Um, and it, it really, w one project generates more project. And that's the other, the other piece of, of having research because once you have a research, it generates data, right? And the data would generate more research projects and more research projects would generate more funding. So in the US, uh, you know, researchers have like a benchmark here. If it's a National Institute of Health funded research and it is a federal research so it's like the gold standard and you you receive an ro1 uh that could range for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions actually if you are very competitive and you're able to maximize what's being advertised by 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 the um by the funding agency but it really is determined by the funding agency and it's a competition it's whoever gets it gets very lucky um but um you can't be lucky all the time. So there's a lot of rejections, obviously. You're not lucky all the time. You get rejected a lot of times. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you also, Dr. Trera. Dr. Kia, we still have a question here coming from Dr. Cadena. May we know how will you address concerns in gathering data via online? Yes, yeah, so this is interesting because one of the oh thank you for asking that question Ja. so i saw hi Ja. <laughs> so i um i actually proposed that i was going to use zoom uh initially and it isn't accepted because it's uh, there it is also a privacy uh content of zoom that you could use it to gather to gather data so if you're using for example a face-to-face -face, uh, an interview like an in-depth interview you can use like this, you can interview patients uh, using Zoom, right? Uh, but I'm also very cautious depending on the population that you want to research. So the reason why I kind of like erased or did not consider Zoom is because many of the population maybe, many of the participants in that population I have targeted may not be comfortable with, with Zoom. So mostly older adults, they may not be you, you know, um, comfortable using Zoom or not technologically savvy. Uh, and it might be a nightmare, you know, when you are trying to interview someone and their internet goes down or they're not even able to click, you know, mute or unmute, uh, and you spend a lot of hours preparing for it, then there goes your interview. So I simplified it by doing a phone interview. Everybody has, you can talk on the other end of the line and people will respond. Uh, so, you try to capture everyone. I guess that's the purpose of my research. I am able to capture everyone. For those who are technically savvy, then you do survey, electronic survey. I send you the link, you complete it, A, B, C, D. You're fine with that. But if you are hesitant to use it because you have some maybe limitations or not comfortable using it, then opt in for a phone interview. And that's perfectly okay. It's, they're both valid uh, ways of obtaining data. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ia. Well, I guess that's it for our open forum. We don't have any questions anymore in the Q&A box. Uh, so uh, once again, Madam Mugid nga salamat, Dr. Ia, for answering those questions and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Reminding all our participants that we already posted the uh, evaluation link in the chat box. At this time, as our appreciation, of course, to Dr. Emerson Ia for his time and valuable contribution in today's webinar, we will now award him his certificate. Let me read the content. This is a certificate of appreciation given to Dr. Emerson Ia. Uh, let me open the certificate for a while. Okay, here is it. Certificate of appreciation is hereby given to Dr. Emerson Ia for having rendered invaluable service as a resource speaker on the next normal, new directions, opportunities, and challenges during the University of St. LaSalle College of Nursing virtual research webinar held on May 7, 2021 at the University of St. LaSalle Bacolod, signed Ivy G. Edemni, Dean of the College of Nursing, and signed Dr. Romeo Teruel, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement. A virtual round of applause for Dr. Ia. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Damo ginya salamat at salamat, Dean and Demney, Batchme Trahera, Dr. Trahera, and everyone, specifically the host. Great job, and to the reactors, and to everyone. It's, it's been a pleasure and I hope to see you in person very, very soon. I still look forward uh, to seeing everyone. It, it's a different experience when we're face to face and we have, you know, side conversations, but I'll take Zoom. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yes, doctor, we will look forward in that. We will also be giving another certificate of appreciation to our reactors. Certificate of Appreciation given to Mr. Dexter Sandania and Mr. O.J. Jimenez for sharing valuable insights and inspirations to the nursing students, faculty, and the Salian community as webinar external and internal reactor during the CON virtual research webinar held on May 7, 2021 via Zoom at the University of St. LaSalle Bacolod City. Signed, IVG Edemni, Dean of the College of Nursing, and signed, Dr. Romeo Teruel, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement. Thank you so much, Mr. Jimenez and Mr. Sendanya. And now to conclude our webinar, may I call on Ms. Anna May Kesson to give us her closing remarks. Thank you, Ms. Dean. New directions, opportunities, and challenges. Dr. Emerson Ia, our esteemed speaker, a Lasallian by heart. To the panelists and attendees, good morning. The COVID-19 pandemic has halted mobility globally. It caught the higher education system by surprise. Dr. Ia mentioned three areas of concerns and experiences as to education, practice, and research. We are so honored and grateful for your sharing, Dr. Ia. The challenge, the changes of increased digitalization and distance learning can definitely be highlighted as opportunities to improve the current ways of delivering nursing education. These changes might also extend to a diverse population. A lot of challenges, however, remain for us lecturers. This represents a huge, a huge challenge while others with prior experience manage the transition easily. Like for example, the use of Zoom link. Yes, we have a lot of adjustment with that one. More have been affected. I like the words Dr. Ia used, languishing, flourishing, go with the flow. Productivity have impacted, motivation and still to do. Nursing research is suspended and affected but we need to use virtual technology in the conduct of research to be scholarly productive, as Dr. Ia have mentioned, and I love it. Many of these challenges are still ahead of us, 
we still have only a limited overview of what direction the virus is taking us. Despite the pandemic, as always, nursing educators will do their utmost to guarantee that the competence needed and skills acquired will be achieved at the same level as before the disruption. Exciting technology, seeing others online, yes, it's hard to separate oneself from work. We have Zoom fatigue. The transition to distance learning was being achieved concurrently and us in clinical areas, we're struggling to deal with the crisis and to cope the challenges and opportunities ahead. Dr. Iya, Dr. Iya did not receive any token from us. We are so thankful, Dr. Iya, for all the sharings that you have. You are indeed truly a Lasallian, but we look forward to the copy of your book, Innovative Teaching Strategies. Lastly, you need a I will yes. donate a copy to the school. Oh, with Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't be afraid to start over. This time, you are not starting from scratch. You are starting from experience, from Tilat Resvi. Thank you and have a blessed and safe day ahead. Animo Lasal. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kason. Yes, Animo Lasal. And yes, that concludes and that ends our webinar on the next normal new directions, opportunities, and challenges. On behalf of the University of St. LaSalle College of Nursing and Center for Research and Engagement, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Dr. Emerson. Hail, hail, alma mater, hail to De La Salle. We'll hold your banner high and bright, a shield of green and white. We'll fight to keep your glory bright, and never shall we fail. Hail to thee, our alma mater, hail, 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 alma mater, hail to De La Salle. We'll hold your banner high and bright, a shield of green and white. We'll fight to keep your glory bright, and never shall we fail. Hail to thee, our alma mater, hail, hail, hail. Hail to thee, our alma mater, hail, hail. Thank you. Thank you.